B-Sides DC would like to thank all of our sponsors, and a special thank you to all of our speakers, volunteers, and organizers for making 2018 a success. Today, we're going to be talking about how to solve CTF problems really, 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 really fast. We're going to also talk about what it looks like to build tools to solve these things really fast. And then we're also going to talk about what it looks like taking these tools, these techniques that you're developing for CTF problems, and applying them to real, uh, real programs, real situations, real systems. Um, so, so like every speaker, I'm going to start with a little bit of background information about myself. Um, my name is Christopher Roberts. I'm a vulnerability researcher slash reverse engineer for Battelle Memorial Institute. I'm also a uh, CTF uh, member at the George Mason Cybersecurity uh, Club. Um, we've had a lot of recent competitions, a lot of recent wins, and uh, those are in part to some of the tools that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and, and in particular, for my research, I love looking at low-level stuff. I like understanding how programs work, how all the bits and bytes work. Uh, when I see assembly, I'm like, yes, I don't have to deal with Java. Um, <laughs> So I, I like finding bugs in systems. I, I, I like trying to analyze systems faster because a, as it is, systems are only getting more and more complicated. And, and it is just becoming harder and harder on me, the reverse engineer, to try and find bugs, to try and find out how these systems are working. So I, I need to build an up-to-date tool set to try and understand um, these things a little bit faster. Um, so let's start out with CTFs. Um, there are a couple problems in CTFs right now that let you use these tools where you drop in a CTF problem and you get out a flag. Um, and, and the first one is reuse. There, there are so many problems right now that have, the very, uh, that have a very similar approach every single time. You uh, break right at the function check, you dump out your memory, and you say, hey, there's a flag right there. And that'll work for a lot of low point problems. For other ones, they'll try and do some broken encryption stuff and do a, a check against that and have you reverse engineer that. Um, and then, yeah, if you're going to bigger problems, um, a lot of times the low point problems might have some cool or novel thing that just eats up your time. You're, you're trying to score as many points as you can in these problems, and you're wasting time trying to figure out how to run a, uh, an NES ROM on your computer. Um, and that just eats up so much time. Uh, and, and then finally, some of the harder ones, your 400 point, your 500 point problems, uh, can just be tedious. Um, it, it might be doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, and, and you're just bored by the time you've actually solved it. Um, and, and so I like to try and reduce the amount of time you have to invest in those so that um, you, you can get to some of the cooler, or more interesting, or the harder problems. Um, so how do we fix this? We automate everything. And we have a number of tools that have come out in, in the past several years that help us do this. T tools from debuggers and debugger scripts and, and um, symbolic execution frameworks like Anger and Triton and, and binary instrumentation frameworks like Triton and Intel's PIN. Um, but that's way too many frameworks. So for this talk, we're going to only talk about two. And, and those are two that I, I've been using for a while in my professional life and in my CTF life. So we're going to talk about Anger, and we're going to talk about Intel's PIN. So these, <laughs> uh, these systems are extremely complex, and, and explaining every single piece of it is out of the scope uh, of this talk. So I'm going to talk at a very high level about what they do and how they impact us in this talk. So first up, we have Anger. Anger is what's called a symbolic execution framework. And if anyone uh, really understands Anger, they're, they're going to cringe at that because really it's concolic execution, but we're not going to get into the nitty gritty. It's a symbolic execution framework, and we can pull a control flow graph. So what, what does that mean? Symbolic execution is the idea that we can represent a program as a series of equations. Every register, every memory region, every uh, file, input, whatever, can be represented as a series of equations because every time you're incrementing through the program, you're saying, you know, add four to my program counter if it's, you know, a risk uh, assembly, or, or 
if you're adding an input and you're trying to understand what your memory looks like, you can say, if it passes this check, my input should be flag one, two, three, four. If my a file needs to be read, we can also model that as an equation. And so symbolic execution allows us to model programs, and, and that's the big takeaway from it. We don't actually have to run the program. We, we can start at any arbitrary point inside of there and model what's going on. We can say that from this slice to this slice, we know that we needed to add 140 to our RAX register, or this memory region changed by, I don't know, shifting something. Um, and, and so you get a really powerful framework for understanding problems that you can't run. So if we're talking about that NES ROM, and it has executable code, instead of trying to Google um, NES emulators and then having to sort through the first 20 pages of Google to filter out all the viruses, um, you can just tell Anger, lift this code right here and run it. And it will tell you to some accuracy what it should be doing. Um, and the second big piece that we want from Anger today is control flow graph recovery. So what does that mean? The control flow graph is a visual representation of how a program runs. So if I send you input and you check it, it's going to branch. We're going to have one branch going one way that says you fail, one branch that goes one way that says you succeed. So every time there's an if, a loop, a, a, a wow, an end, a call, a jump, whatever, we have a different block to represent that code that we're going to execute. And so you get a really nice visual representation of what's going on. Um, and, and after I talk about Intel, I'll show you an example of a control flow graph and why they're so important. Um, so, so now let's briefly talk about it, Intel's PIN. Um, it, it's an instrumentation framework that only works on x86 and AMD64. So, so just modern system, or excuse me, not modern system, that, that's, that's wrong, on um, uh, Intel chips right now. Um, but binary instrumentation lets you slot in code uh, into other programs that does something that you would want. So you could track memory reads and writes if your program wouldn't normally print those out. You, you can... Um, hook different functions. If there's a uh, key check, you could hook that and have that printed out. But what we're interested in is something called instruction counting. And so instruction counting in this case is going to tell us literally how many instructions the processor ran um, when it's running through a program. Um, and, and that's what's going to be important for the uh, tool that uh, I'll be talking about in a little bit. So. Colors aren't as good as I had hoped, but on the right, we have an example of a control flow graph. It's ugly and hard to read, but th the big takeaway is we have these blocks that represent code. And each of these blocks does something to registers or to memory. Um, we, we don't really care what those specifics are, but Anger does. And so we can tell Anger, given this program, if I want to get to the end and I want to avoid some sort of bad condition, if I want to avoid um, your flag is not correct, I can tell it to start here and end here. Um, I can give it an exact slice that I want it to run through without actually having to run it and tell it to trace through these specific basic blocks and tell me how to get there. And when you're representing a program like this, you're able to get so much more insight into what's going on. You can see what your memory needs to look like, what your registers need to look like. You can ask very specific questions. Can you even get there from there? Um, oh yeah, and then does one variable influence another? Yeah, you get a small concept of Tain analysis, but that's also out of the scope of this. We, we don't care about that for the tools and techniques we'll be talking about here. So the, the next one I, I have PIN. Um, I tried to blow it up as much as I can. We're just running an example program, and at the very end, we have a count. That count is the number of instructions that this program executed, from starting to linking to mapping memory to running through linked libraries to finally exiting every single one. And PIN let us instrument the code to increment that count every single time we hit an instruction. So I have a CTF problem here, and I ran A into it, and it gave me some bogus count, I don't really care about that. But what happens when, oh, it's supposed to pop up. Oh no, my video's failing. Okay, well, I'll just talk to you a little bit. L looking back at that first one, 
That's a bad demo, oh no. So when you give it different inputs, A, B, C, D, E, F, A, A, B, B, whatever you want, you're still going to get that instruction count. You're going to get something that's maybe changing, maybe it's the exact same. And in CTF problems, there's a code recycling problem, back to that very first point, where they're generally doing what's called incremental checking. Every character in your flag is getting checked uniquely. And we're actually kind of using um, some of uh, libc's optimizations against it. So let me jump past the video. So, so when we talk about a reverse engineering problem, and, and we're trying to understand how it works, we pull up that control flow graph again. And if this is an easier problem, or the CTF authors like us, or maybe they just don't hate us that much, you might get something that looks like this. Um, you get a couple blocks here and a little bit of logic. There's like two if statements. That's not too bad. You can use traditional tools to solve this. You can attach a debugger. You can start um, statically analyzing the code. But what if the CTF authors really hate us? Well, they could turn these two checks into 160. And I know I wouldn't want to attach a debugger and stop at every single one of those checks and try and figure out what's going on. Um, and CTF authors don't have to be that nice. They can do this. Um, th that is, I, I think I'd counted it out to 25,000 individual checks. And, and for people who've worked with malware, th this is actually the LLVM Obfuscate post processor. It, it is literally designed to make it nearly impossible to re reverse engineer it. Now there are tools online to try and help that, but that sucks. <laughs> so w we need a way to try and solve problems like this so that we can get all of the points. I want to come in first. I, I don't want to just ignore this one and say this one's too hard. So we need to divide up the problem. We need to understand what's going on in these CTF problems. And generally, they're kind of broken up into three parts. You got to figure out how to run it. You got to figure out what the check is. And then you got to figure out how to break the check or how to make it work for you. Um, and, and so generally, your steps kind of look like this, trying to find a library, trying to see if it's an NES emulator, trying to um, uh, find a, a weird environment variable. You need to find your checks. There's usually a lot of math in that. Um, usually whatever's the biggest function in there is, is probably your checking function. Um, and then you go in GDB and, and you start typing in this a bunch. Um, and then you gotta close out of GDB and you gotta reopen and start doing this again. Um, and, and then, uh, uh, yeah, eventually you might get repetitive stress syndrome, but. Um, so because I, I wanna have my hands forever, um, I'm instead gonna look at what's going on. So at some part in that check function, we're gonna use one of these. If you've ever programmed in C, if you've ever taken a CS class, you, you've seen one of these. And it's a comparison function. Um, they're pretty simple. You give it two inputs and it says yay or nay. Yes, they're equal. No, no they're not equal. Um, and I think there's a handful more, but they all work on the exact same premise. So uh, the one that was the smallest, that was the easiest to bring up here, was string compare. Whew. Um, so given two pointers, start at the beginning of the pointer, check to see if the first two are equal, and then exit out. And you do this again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And you, you run this until you find an null terminate. That, that's just a normal thing for strings. But what happens if only the first one is equal to that second one? That first character in both strings is equal, but the second character isn't. Well, it exits out early. Um, so it, you might be able to follow along with what I'm saying here. If my first character is right, I execute slightly more instructions. If my first two characters are right, I execute slightly more instructions. A and this happens over and over again for each of these comparison functions. So if there were some way to count instructions, um, we, we, we could pretty quickly figure out what's going on. So hopefully this next video works. Man, all of my videos are failing me. Oh, I just needed to double click it? Oh, cool, okay. <laughs>
What? We have to reverse engineer it? Is it running? Man. Okay, well, well I have the videos on here. Um, and, and once we get past this part, uh, I'll, I'll pull up the videos. I've got them in a different folder. Um, but what we're doing here is we're literally running through the alphabet for that first character. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way down. You know the alphabet. And we're going to see that one of those characters executes more instructions than the other ones. What a coincidence. Um, and, and so this process can be pretty hard. Oh, you, you can see the command up there. Um, uh, I, I love gross bash one-liners, but I know the security community doesn't. So I, I decided to compress all of this into a tool and put it all online so that you don't need to write a bash loop that loops over every single character in the alphabet and then runs pin against it to try and instrument it and do all of this funkiness. So I built a tool called pinctf. Um, and all it is is it's automating that process of checking the next input against your flag. Um, you can do parallel processing. You can do... Uh, command line arguments, you can do standard in, um, and you can also recover from canceled se sessions, because it, it can suck when halfway through you figure out you have an issue in your bash loop, and you got to start all over again. Oh, man. That's why you shouldn't write bash one-liners. All right, so this next one is the one that I, I, I will pull up if it's not coming up. Got some technical difficulties. All of my demos are failing me today. All right. And give me just one moment, and I will open up the videos for you. Cancel out. There we go. You guys get to see all of my personal documents. All right, pin CTF. Video. Man, I took all this time to record these videos for you guys. Okay, cool. Oh, yes, we can see it. Perfect. So we're running it through once, and we can see we're checking the very end character, and it's kind of going a little bit slow. I wanted to give you guys lightning fast uh, uh, CTF solving. So instead of running it on one core, I'm going to run 22 concurrent executions of this thing on, on a beefy system I've got somewhere else. Oh, the video's jumping ahead of me. And you can see this flag printed out before I can even finish that sentence. <laughs> and... <laughs> They wanted you to use hardware breakpoints instead of instruction counting, but because they used a mem compare somewhere down the line, it didn't matter. All right, so let's find where we were. That was real time. Yeah, there, there was no speeding up in that video. Um, if we've got time, I can run it a couple times and you can, you can uh, Get, pull out your stopwatch if you want. Um, so that's cool when, when there's one issue to overcome. In, in reverse engineering problems, there's a mem copy or a stir compare or a, a, a whatever, some sort of bite for bite comparison. But what happens when we come to ponables, to exploitables? There's so many different things you need to overcome. You might be given a libc, you might have to fight ASLR, you might have to fight dep, you might have a weird puzzle to solve before you even get the, uh, to the, the function. You, you, I don't know, you, you might have to make your own primitive and, and try and figure out how all of that works. And then you have this nonsense of trying to connect to a port and exploiting it. Holy cow, that is way too much effort. Um, so let's talk about a, a little bit about some of the most common vulnerabilities you see in CTF problems. So the two big ones outside of heap exploitation are buffer overflows and format string vulnerabilities. 
Um, if you've taken a CS class that does C programming, they've talk, probably talked about buffer overflows. You have some variable on the stack that has too many uh, inputs, or I guess too much of an input fed into it, and it writes values all the way up the stack, possibly corrupting your program counter, and then you can point this program counter wherever you want. So sometimes in CTF problems, they make it convenient for you and they have a win function. So that's one type you can have. Uh, sometimes they're not as nice and they're trying to emulate uh, uh, problems from the 1990s, and you have to use shell code. Okay, that's not too bad. You can Google shell code and you can try and finagle what, what is little endian and, and trying to get all this swapping done. Um, and, and then if they're trying to emulate more modern systems, they might make you do something called a ROP chain. Um, and, and I won't go into the, the specifics, but just knowing that these are the high level techniques towards a lot of these problems is enough for this demonstration. Um, so that can be a lot of work. I, I gotta run all sorts of tools or I might have to build one of these manually. Um, yeah. That sucks. Okay, so n now that we've identified the first sucky problem, let's look at the second one. Format strings. So if you do printf and you have your user input just right there in printf, you can do whatever you want. You can print out values from memory, you can write to arbitrary locations, y you own the whole thing. And, and so generally they're kind of in two parts. One is you leak a flag from somewhere in memory, who knows. Um, and then the second one is you overwrite some writable portion of memory to make it point to something malicious, um, like some shell code, a win function, or a rob chain. Woo, awesome, okay. And usually we overwrite the got, the global offset table, or the PLT, the procedure linkage table. And holy cow, that's a lot of work. That's way too much work for me, okay. So let's talk about a framework that makes this a little bit easier, Pwn Tools. It's a Python library. Um, if you Google Pwn Tools format strings or Pwn Tools buffer overflow, they have a whole bunch of things that make it so much easier. They can fix all of your endian swapping, endianness swapping, they can build some of your format string payloads for you. Um, and then it just sounds kind of cool. Um, yeah, you can interact with network sockets, you can run processes. Uh, it, it, it's got the whole nine yards um, and it makes it really, really, really easy. Um, yeah, it's probably my shortest slide. So, Again, we gotta break up this problem if we want to solve this thing really, really, really fast. We have to understand how to run the program. Is it taking in a command line argument? Is it standard in? What is it? Um, we have to overcome some sort of small puzzle. Um, it, it might be entering in our name, it might be a menu. Sometimes they make you do some math for them. Who, who knows? Um, I, I certainly don't. And then we need to find the vulnerability. We, we need to accurately identify what this vulnerability is and we need a reliable method to do this. Um, and then finally, we need to weaponize it and throw it. That's a lot of steps. It's a reason why a lot of pwn problems have a lot of points associated with them. Well, conveniently, um, we've got a couple tools that can help us with that. So Anger can run the program wherever. Um, the symbolic execution stuff that was tracing a program for us can help us overcome that puzzle. And it can also, to some extent, help us find a vulnerability. Um, so all that we're left with now is weaponizing the vulnerability and throwing it. So if we had some sort of framework that made it easy to run these things or build format string payloads, I guess we'd be in luck. Look at that. So th th there's a couple examples online on wh what they call automatic exploit generation. And I'll get to the uh, talking about those and um, uh, talking about why they suck in just a moment. But uh, we want to try and make this process easier. So what are the hard parts? Finding the input. Like, I, I don't know what we're trying to send into this program to make it crash or make it do whatever. We need to fix common mistakes because I can't keep that in my head. I don't remember how, what, what kind of endianness I'm on. Um, and then there's a concept of bad characters in shellcode. So we talked about strings for a second earlier and we talked about a null terminator. It's just a null byte in there that tells you to stop the string. Well, if we put shellcode into there, it's gonna truncate our shellcode and it won't run properly. So we need a method of identifying those bad bytes. Um, and, and then because I'm a lazy human being, I, I want it to send the exploit for me and I want it to print out the flag too. So. Uh, as you guys guessed it, the reason why you're sitting here, there is a tool that can do all this for us. Um, I, I built it and it's called Zeratool. Um, it, it was originally a slur that someone had called me because I was playing a character named Zeratool. Zeratool. 
T-U-L. Um, and, and so it, it's the process of automating every single one of these components so that we can get all the points, because that, that's what we want. We want to solve all these problems really, really fast so that we can spend our time trying to solve the harder problems. So it's actually kind of easy to figure out what kind of input you're looking for. You, you can just see what functions are in there. Um, if it has open, it's probably interacting with a file. Um, if it's doing gets or scanf or read, it's probably standard in. Um, and anything else, you can just kind of throw into a bucket and say it's probably an argument. Or, or maybe I should just you know, exit out a zero tool and uh, try and figure out what's actually going on. All right, so now that we've done the hard part, let's talk a little bit about memory and how traditional, or at least online, automatic exploit generation works. So this is our program here running in memory. Um, no videos this time, so it should work. Um, and so we have the stack all the way down there. So we're going to talk about stack overflows in this example, because I, I think those ones are really visual. When you're calling a function, you have this concept of a stack frame. You have your return address. You have any arguments you put in there. You have your, um, your local variables there. And usually one of those guys, the, one of the local variables, usually gets overwritten for a buffer overflow. So every single time you're running a program in, say, anger, you need to ask, did that return address somehow become symbolic? Is there some value in one of those program state representations that can overwrite that thing? Cool, this seems pretty intuitive, okay. That doesn't seem too bad, okay. So we've got our symbolic return address. Well, what next? Um, we need to ask Anger or our SMT prover, uh, a component in Anger that tells us whether something can or can't happen, um, can this point back into some form of user input? Okay, so we're asking it two things now. Is our return address symbolic? And can we point that program counter to user input? Okay, so this isn't too complicated. I can handle this kind of math. Um, and then generally, you're trying to get some sort of execution. Not everyone's gonna be so nice as to give you a win function. So we need to see if there's a way we can point it at some shell code or a ROP chain. And the current online examples show you um, some shell code some uh, crappy shell code, but I, I won't get into that. So we've got some animation 2.0 going on. Yeah. So we just replace our input with shell code and we ask Anger if that's possible. So we have a couple issues here. This is pretty bad. Like in theory, it's nice and everything, but buffer overflows are like almost never this clean. What if you only have partial control? What if you have bad bytes? What, what if your, argue, or your corruption is up there in the BSS? Um, what, what if it's doing something in the heap? Like, th this is awesome for academic use. Um, oh, there, here I was talking about the issues on the next page. Cool. Um, oh, right, one shell code choice. What, what if your one shell code doesn't work? What, what if um, uh, they're, they're blocking syscalls or you're in a sandbox or they're using ptrace or uh, one of any modern techniques at trying to mitigate that stuff? You need a way to overcome those techniques, maybe try multiple shell codes or try and run encoders on your shell code. Um, and what if you don't have full control over the program counter? Sometimes that's okay. Um, sometimes you only need three bytes or two bytes or one byte. There are no one byte examples in my uh, examples, but in theory it could work. Um, and then yeah, I'm lazy. It doesn't throw the exploit for you. Like it just kind of prints it out and it says good luck. Um, and, and if you run the current one on anger, it just breaks, it doesn't do anything. And then they don't have anything for format strings. Holy cow, we've got issue after issue after issue with all these public examples. So uh, if you're willing to code up all of these um, uh, edge cases, you can use pwn tools to cover all of those. Pwn tools can give you all sorts of shell code. It can give you ARM shell code, x86 shell code. I think it can give you MIPS shell code. Um, it can also run encoders on it. So if you have a null byte, or if you have a new line character and you can't have that in your input, we can run encoders and get rid of that. It's easy. Um, and so one of the things that I added into ZeroTool was to do just that. Um, yeah, there's a concept of stack-based shellcode versus non-stack-based shellcode. We don't care about that, but that's another issue that can happen here that um, we need to be able to solve. Um, yeah, kind of have that point twice there. Cool, so by combining these two tools together, uh, I can ask Anger if it's possible to use the shellcode. I can say, hey, Anger, is, are there any issues with putting a new line in my uh, input? 
are there any issues with doing a null character in my input? Um, and it's really good at saying yes or no. Um, and so that's the SMT prover uh, part of that again. So this is all kind of cool, but where are the examples? So uh, I'm gonna talk about a super duper simple um, uh, binary with a buffer overflow. It has a check and it, it wants you to have dead beef somewhere on the stack and then it lets you do your overflow. Um, if you've done a pwnable before, this is really easy, but if you're trying to automate that, that can be really, really hard. Um, you won't be able to do that with the online automatic exploit generation stuff because of that check. It'll say, yeah, I can corrupt it, but so what? What happens? I don't know. So let's show you how it should be done with a video that won't work. Well, it, all right, well, luckily, ah, don't look at my Spotify. Okay, now that we already have our videos folder up here, Oh, look at that. I'm glad I have good folder management for this one. Cool. So I gave it, oh, I gotta share the screen too. Ah, all right. Man, presenting's hard. All right. Cool, okay. So all these are super short videos, so it shouldn't be too bad. I'm giving it just the program. I'm giving it this URL that they gave me, and, I, and I'm giving it the port, that's it. I'm telling Zeratool to find the vulnerability in this program, overcome their puzzle, and send an exploit for me and get me that flag. So we're running through the program right now. We're checking to see what the input is. We wanna see if it's a standard in, an argument, a file, whatever. We then are trying to find that vulnerability in there. Um, look, it already found it. It'll build a proof of concept for us if it fails somewhere down the line. It's overcome that hard check already. And right now it's trying to use the point to win function technique. So this is where it had a win function in it earlier. And this one demos really well because uh, it works just every time. Oh, cool. Um, and then I suck at programming, so the NDNS was messed up. So it, it's gonna go back through there and fix it for me. It's gonna test it locally. Um, yeah, it's just stuff is flying by. Um, and it said, hooray, we did it. Now let's throw it remotely. So it's fixing the endiness for me again because I'm still really bad at programming. And it's throwing that right now for me. And as soon as that connection's made, it's going to run LS, it's gonna try and find a flag and cat it. Um, yeah, cool. And then uh, I guess CTF flag spoilers, this one is called No You Suck. Um, and it's currently up on uh, the uh, University of Central Florida's CTF training uh, stuff. I think it's a 100 or 150 point poning problem. Um, it's not too hard if, if you're a uh, expert at this kind of stuff, but um, to automatically solve that, how long was that video? That video was a minute and four seconds. I didn't have to open up IDA. I didn't have to open up GDB. I didn't have to open up anything. This is time I can now spend solving the harder problems. All right. Cool. Oh, right, and then format strings kind of suck right now. Um, in Anger, these are the only five lines that represent format strings. As soon as you get to there, it just kind of says, yeah, that sucks, bro, I'm sorry. Um, and, and then it exits out. It says, I'm done, stopping, no more. Um, if we're trying to find format string vulnerabilities, that's, that's not cool, that's not acceptable. Um, so what does it look like to model a format string vulnerability? Well, generally it's kind of composed in, in, into any of these three bottom um, uh, right primitives. You, you wanna see if it's symbolic and then if uh, that input to that printf can contain any of this, uh, this is nonsense, this long uh, string here, um, then you're gonna try and build that and every single time you're adding into it, you're using a write primitive for the percent n that just makes it harder. So as you're trying to build this and debug this, all these addresses are changing and your buffer is getting longer and it's a lot to manage if you haven't done a lot of format strings before. But Pwn Tools is awesome. They can build us a format string payload. We can say, I wanna write this value at this address and it'll be like, here you go. It's awesome, holy cow. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pair up 
pwn tools with Angular, and we're going to ask Angular if we can build this entire format string payload as the first argument into printf. Sounds like it'd be a, a good format string vulnerability to me. Look at that, I already talked about stuff that was on this slide. Yeah, uh, w w one other piece here is as you're testing different addresses for your shellcode or your point to win or your ROP chain, um, the size of your format string can change. So if you're trying to port this to other CTF problems or if you recompile the problem, the answer can be completely different. But Angular's really good at maintaining those addresses for us. That's awesome. So we can ask Angular to um, build and solve those uh, uh, potential inputs automatically. And we're using the exact same logic we had before to overcome that puzzle or that challenge, that problem step we had, if it's a menu or whatever. Um, and then if I didn't start these uh, last week, this is where my other video would be. Um, so these tools are all online. The format string one takes a couple minutes. It's three or four minutes. I didn't think it'd be a very good demo to just drop that one in here. But where do you go next? How does all of this stuff translate to real world um, problems? Well, we, we have an issue of finding vulnerabilities. We have a, an issue of trying to find memory leaks if we're trying to pair it for even harder vulnerabilities. And um, my ROP chain building stuff in there is kind of bad. Um, and, and there's better tools online to, to fix that. So y you can use modern um, fuzzers like AFL or Driller or TFuzz to find these vulnerabilities for us. You don't have to um, concolically analyze it and run it at some random program slice and do all of that jazz um, because usually they just run with a, a good old dot slash my pwnable problem. Um, and then info leaks. If you're working against ASLR, you need to know where some address is. And generally you accomplish this through some sort of information disclosure. You get some pointer that gets leaked out to you that you can use to calculate the base of libc and everything is awesome because now you can call uh, system bin sh. Uh, that's something that I don't handle here, but with more programming, it could be handled. Um, and then I'm very bad at uh, automating ROP chains. Oh, and, and then if someone is uh, ambitious one day, may maybe heap exploitation can be uh, automated. Um, so back to that so what. These CTF problems are, are kind of cool, I guess. You can get some points. You can translate that into bragging rights. Maybe you get a trophy at some CTF competition. But how does that impact the real systems, the, the systems we're running, the systems we're using today? Um, and I, I, I like to think that a lot of CTF problems translate pretty easily to embedded devices. If you look at routers, if you look at smart light bulbs or smart fridges or smart whatever, and you Google command injection router, you're gonna get like 20 hits from just this week. It's ridiculous. You're gonna see 30 hits of buffer overflows. You're, you're, these things are wide open and they translate really well into these embedded systems, but we need to scale them out even farther. The, the next step beyond that is very likely trying to handle large systems and programs and, and even entire uh, firmware um, or hypervisors, holy cow, that, that'd be really hard. Um, so it's kind of nice talking about all of this stuff and, and being wishy-washy and saying this is what we should do. So I, I thought it'd be cool to actually talk about the translation of all of this into an actual vulnerability. Um, now I really like this one because the POC fits on a PowerPoint bullet. Like, you go to the address of this thing, you slot in a semicolon, and then you just type in whatever you want. It can be reboot, it can be um, execute, whatever, who knows? Um, and this one impacted 11 of the most um, common home routers in the world. The statistics on it were somewhere between 1.5 and 2 million routers were impacted by this, like one, one semicolon right there. So it's really, really hard to find if you actually go through the whole thing. And it's just really easy to exploit. So, oh no, it's another video. Crap. All right, let's see if I was prepared. Oh, I do, I do have that video, okay. So, 
So th this one's using a more proprietary tool that's taken these techniques even farther. We're doing representations across an entire firmware for this router. We're eventually going to stumble across the web server in this example. We're going to model every input that's going into every function. We're going to distribute that across several cores. Uh, I'm using a much faster uh, computer in this uh, demo. And, and we're going to check for those exact same conditions. We're checking for memory corruption. We're checking for format strings. And for this tool, I've even added command injection testing. We're seeing if any form of input could corrupt um, input that gets passed into a system call, or an exec call, or a popen, or whatever have you. Um, and, and even before I finished it, it found it. Ugh, pause. So because you're representing these programs symbolically, you have all of this tracing information. You can find out what is going on behind the scenes with these programs. And in this example right here, I can see what all the registers should be to get to that command injection vulnerability. Well, you say that's nice, who cares? I wanna see where the actual vulnerability gets. Well, we're also tracking memory. We're tracking the stack. We can see every single piece that's going on here. Um, oh no, I built in time for talking and I paused it. Um, uh, yeah, so, so we can track every single action coming out of our common functions. We can see that sprintf copied something into something that gets called into system. And because I, I like living dangerously, I always make it copy and reboot if it can. Um, it's a very visual indicator to see if you can exploit it. So if you do uh, colon reboot against one of these routers, it just goes down. You can see all the lights go down. You don't have to worry about spaces or anything. And that's again something we can see right here because we're symbolically executing it. We have greater insight into where these bugs are and what the program state needs to look like to get there. Um, and then at the very bottom, I have a very pitiful example of what the uh, uh, stack looks like. Um, yeah, I think because it went into the, the PLT or the GOT, you had like one little value there on the stack. But one day that view will be better. Um, so you can find these vulnerabilities so much faster when you apply tools and techniques for CTFs towards systems like the embedded here. And I'm thinking, as we're moving forward, we need to translate our tools, our fuzzers, our analyzers to handle more things like this. We need to be able to just put more compute resources into finding bugs. I don't wanna to have to go through and look at a giant embedded firmware and try and open up every single one in Ida Pro trying to get every single one. Oh, it loops, look at that. All right. And, and trying to find those exploitable conditions myself. I can make the tools we have today do that for me. And that makes it a lot easier to find these bugs and vulnerabilities. Cool. So I tried to rush through this one a little bit. I've got 10 minutes, awesome. So uh, two days ago, I finished writing a tool for even more CTF solving. Um, and I've named it Rocket Shot. And, and it's got this really complicated thing in here called backwards program slice stitching. Um, I, I think I saw like 10 people's eyes roll over. Uh, so, so what does that mean? I, I have no idea. Um, we were talking a little bit about a control flow graph earlier. And each of those little blocks on there can be a slice of the program. And so I asked myself, is there a way that you can go inside out in a program? Instead of having to do all this crazy initialization, all of this hard checks, is there a way that we can skip all the hard stuff and go right to the very end where it prints the function or prints the flag? Excuse me. Um, oh yeah, um, and then another reason why I put it on here. It's really, really fast. Um, and, and so I've got two examples. I've got one video for Rocket Shot um, that's going to do just that. It's going to take um, this control flow graph we have here, it's going to run from the start to the end of every single basic block. It's gonna say, that one's bad, this one's good. And we're gonna track it, we're gonna say, oh, okay. If this is a graph, what do our pre predecessors look like? I'm gonna say, okay, well, let's step it out again, let's unwind it even more. Um, it's hard to see, so I, I gave us some labels so we can see where we were. The left one's good, the right one's bad. So we can start here, we say, okay, I want this one. What's above it? How do I get to it? And so I can start my execution on a program slice, program slice, 
at the top of that first basic block going down. I can do this again and again and again. And I'm running slices of programs that run so much faster than the actual programs themselves. Hey, why does this one work? Oh, it's not, it's just full screen. All right, you better believe I've got a video for this one. Uh. So this is a challenge from Pico CTF 2014, where we're gonna iterate over every single node in there, doing that small slice execution. This is in real time. <laughs> um, and we're checking for some sort of file descriptor activity. We wanna see if there's some flag something going on. And if we get it, it's gonna print out the flag and it's gonna give us some garbage because we have uninitialized variables. Ugh, ew. Um, so as soon as we see that, we remove all the other ones and we say, okay, what are the predecessors of that one? And we start doing this recursive thing here. It's already finished, I gotta slow these things down. Um, and so I'm gonna control C here because it says the flag is done. All right, well, I, I was very tired last night when I was building this one. Um, oh, there it is. It says solving equations is lots of fun. I should have zoomed in on that. But o o over the space of 45 seconds, about a minute, we were able to run this program with next to no arguments and have it spit out this flag from this technique where we're unwinding backwards up all of these um, problems. And so here I'm just confirming that. We, we run solving equations is lots of fun and we get our flag. Yeah. Then I'm very quickly running out of time. I've got three minutes. So all of these tools are up on GitHub. I posted Rocket Shot this morning. Um, I started running it through the entire suite of the Anger CTF challenge problems, and it's headed surprisingly good um, uh, uh, return on finding flags for me. And so I'm hoping going forward that by giving you guys these tools that we can encourage CTF writers to get, build us even harder problems, hopefully ones that model more vulnerabilities, uh, that, that model more real world systems so that we in turn can build even better uh, techniques and tools to solve those. So um, with that, thank you.